Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Anka Angela. I work for the European Space Agency. I'm actually in the Earth Observation Directorate working on uh, what we call now digital innovation. So today I will try to give you a bit of an overview of how we look at open science and open innovation in ESA, in particular in ESA Earth Observation. I want to thank Julia for making my job so easy because she introduced a lot of the, um, let's say, fundamental things that we're also thinking about. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start off with, uh, with some of the challenges that we're currently looking at. And this presentation is very much focused on the, let's say, earth system science perspective. Um, this is just um, a picture, well, there are two pictures. One of them is, uh, on the, the one on the left shows the, the scar on the island of Rhodos from this summer, um, and one from, uh, as seen by Sentinel-1, and one on the right shows one of the active fires that contributed to that huge scar. We've seen fires, we've seen extreme wildfires, extreme heat waves this summer, and not just this summer, but also in, the, uh, in recent years, not just in Europe, but globally. We've seen the fires in Canada, Maui, and so forth. This is another example of a different challenge. So it's not a wildfire, this is uh, land surface temperature observed by Sentinel-3. Um, and bear in mind, this is land temperature. I hope you can read the numbers there. Um, so it's not air temperature, actually, actually how hot the, air, uh, the, the land feels to touch. And we have seen uh, in the morning of 17th of July, 2023, uh, over 45 degrees in Rome, Celsius, 50 in other parts of Italy, and well, you can pretty much get an idea of what is there. We're not dealing just with climate change though as, as global challenge. Uh, there are things that are um, you know, adding on to that. Um, one example is geohazards. These are um, views of the same event. Probably all know it. It's the, the earthquake that hit Turkey and Syria um, early in the year in February. And this is the information, some of the information, some of the um, uh, measurements that we could do from Sentinel-1 again and Sentinel-2. You see the horizontal displacement from Sentinel-2, the fringes in the interferogram from Sentinel-1. It's all possible because all this data is open, right? But it paints a picture of what kind of challenges we're dealing with. And finally, it's not just geohazards, it's not just climate, but there are all those things that we are actively contributing to. And one of these big challenges that we're facing today is loss of biodiversity and um, affected ecosystem services. This is a report that was published in 2019 uh, by IPBS on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And some of the key findings are, um, to be frank, quite scary. Um, there's over 1 million species threatened with extinction. Uh, we don't have enough global response. We need transformative changes to restore and protect our nature. And there are those five main drivers listed there. Um, and we can point to ourselves in many of those. Uh, now, what is the message I'm trying to pass? We are dealing as a society with a lot of global challenges. There's not one institution that can do it all. Uh, there's not one group that can do it all. Luckily, we do have a lot of data to work with. This is how currently um, the picture of the ESA developed Earth Observation missions looks like. There's quite a big density of missions there. You see a lot of heritage missions, but also operational missions develop, um, delivering data every day. We have in development a huge number of satellites. Julia hinted at that, that there are a lot of satellites more coming. Uh, so here we have not just the science missions, those um, pioneering uh, science missions with new Earth observation sensors, with new observing modes that are really pushing the boundaries of what we can do with science to understand our Earth. We have the Copernicus missions, and that's a growing number also with the upcoming expansion missions, next generations, and so forth that we're working on with our partners in the European Commission, and also the meteorological missions for which we partner with UMETSAT. So here's another key point. We need these international global partnerships and international collaboration. Why are we doing this? We're trying to um, gain a better understanding of the science of our planet, how our planet works, in order to be able to deal with those challenges that I've listed in the beginning. It's not just those, but just to give an idea. And because I'm a SAR person, I will just point to one of the upcoming missions that is really um, uh, fantastic in my view. So it's called Harmony. It was selected as the 10th Earth Explorer mission. Uh, these Earth Explorers are uh, really pioneering missions 
that are um, giving us information never seen before. So we, we are now able to see things that we've never been able to see. This will be two satellites information flying with Sentinel-1, giving us information about our um, ice, our land dynamics, and our oceans. So there's a lot of data out there. Uh, we do have the most extraordinary Earth observing system in the world, uh, provided by Europe. Um, we are able now to look at our planet from so many different perspectives, and a lot of this data, the majority of this data is open. What do we do with it? Um, if you've seen yesterday the presentation from Diego Fernandez in the um, EuroGeo workshop, you probably um, have seen parts of this. But this is um, just an illustration of what we can achieve if we have multiple groups working together, accessing data sets provided by several satellites, combining it with other sources of data in an open source environment. This is um, an attempt that we make now to uh, reconstruct the Antarctic system. So this is one, uh, just, just one of the, of the projects that we're um, developing in this direction. It's part of a bigger effort that's called the Digital Twin Earth, a new program of ESA that is building this component. And here is really um, an illustration of how, if we put all these things together, open data, the open source tools, but also collaboration, international collaboration, we can achieve and we can see things that we haven't been able to see before. On the dynamics of the ice sheets, how that interacts with all the um, um, other uh, dynamics in the ocean and so forth. This is one example um, of how um, digital twins can look like, right? but we can imagine a lot of different things. For this, we launched this um, digital twin earth program that aims to demonstrate the potential value of earth observation for the future evolution also of the Destination Earth Program, the flagship initiative of the European Commission. And um, we are bringing together in ESA, uh, through this program, the latest Earth observation-based products, science results and capabilities to a pre-operational level um, and develop a set of these components. So we're trying to look at the Earth system through its subsystems and make this 4D reconstruction for a better understanding ultimately to provide actionable solutions for society. And there's been a lot of talk about how to bring these results closer to the world, but it's also a matter of how to bring the world closer and contributing to the development of these results. There are only so many ways in which opening up data and uh, putting forth open innovation principles can be applied because not all domains can be made open and not all data can be made open. But there are so many opportunities that come from uh, domains such as looking at the climate, uh, looking at the earth system, biodiversity, health, and so forth. We are talking about openness, openness in the scientific process, open innovation. So trying to bring the open principles into the commercial realm. Ultimately, what we try to achieve is to push the scientific discovery and to make sure that we have the premises for the scientific discoveries to be turned into innovation. Um, there's this definition um, from the former uh, Nobel Prize winner that says discovery is seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. Well, the, the challenge here is to make sure that everybody is actually in the equation, right? Um, so how do we look about the um, open innovation and open science process? We started thinking in ESA about this um, a long time ago. Um, the first idea was, let's open up the, your research process. This is an idea that dates back to 2015. Um, and the group that was working on that back then, uh, wasn't in ESA then, um, they took the EO research cycle, is that okay, what are the components from the conceptualization to data gathering, analysis, publication, and, um, and review? And let's see what can we put here? What, what is this made of, right? So they identified a lot of those blue boxes that you see there, um, that is basically um, just putting pieces together. Um, and those, those boxes are quite heterogeneous. So um, it's about virtual labs, uh, collaboration, uh, science blogs, MOOCs, um, open access publications, and so forth. 
And the idea was, let's just invest in these things, right? Let's, let's see what we can do if we, yeah, if we invest on, on these elements. So there was a lot of push for that and a lot of foundational activities that, fund, um, that we implemented. And we got some pretty cool results. Um, Snap is one of the things that resulted out of this. And we all know uh, what a huge uh, uptake it has had. We had the open call launched, uh, a huge number of uh, MOOCs, massive open online courses uh, that ESA funded, and a lot of virtual, lab virtual laboratories, uh, open source tools that were developed. However, the, looking back now to 2015, this was a great idea. Now in 2023, um, developing all these things in isolation doesn't make much more sense. So we need something that is a bit more structured. Building on all of these foundational activities, how can we streamline a bit the investments that we do on open science and open innovation so that it really makes an impact? So um, we're advancing towards something that is much more result oriented, something that can be measured, uh, that can give us an idea of what is the value that we get out of implementing open science and out of promoting open innovation. And these are, um, let's say, um, eight, eight elements, eight bullets that we, uh, we think are important to look at. So on the one hand, uh, we talk about open data. It's not just um, the Earth observation data, but here we talk about <clears throat> the data that is input and output into the uh, scientific workflows that we do. So we're funding a lot of scientific activities, a lot of the work that went into the digital twin that you saw before, right? How do we make sure that all the code that produces and uses that data is open source and can be reused by others? How do we make sure that that data is actually linked to that code and that the documentation associated to that is provided with open access? In other words, how do we make sure that we can get end-to-end -end open access workflows and documentation? These four elements are important, but they're just really setting up, setting a base, because unless you have demonstrated your producibility, that's not really working. And unless you have real adoption and the community is actually actively doing that, it's not really working. So the next element is, let's aim to demonstrate that workflows are reproducible across platforms, whether it's ESA platforms, whether it's NASA platforms, whether it's platform by another space agency, or just a, a commercial platform run by, by a commercial operator. And let's make sure that people know how to do this. So open science education is critically important. I want to applaud Julia for her effort on educating the community here, because this is really important. Um, and making sure that the practice is actually happening, right? So uh, ESA has a role to play here in providing those guidelines on uh, how the community should actually do open science. And finally, it's the community itself that needs to be healthy, needs to be animated, and needs to be inclusive. We're not working uh, on this alone. And actually, we've taken inspiration from a lot of uh, great initiatives that are happening globally. You probably know uh, about the open science policy of the EU that defines the standard method of working under its research and innovation funding program. Under Horizon Europe, it's a legal obligation to ensure open access to publication and to research data. There is this fantastic recommendation from UNESCO on open science that is the, actually the first international standard setting instrument in open science. There is the effort done by our colleagues in NASA with the Open Source Science Initiative that makes publicly funded research transparent, inclusive, accessible, and reproducible. And we can see that we're all kind of speaking the same language and using the same terms. And efforts from publishers also, such as AGU, that promote uh, open uh, access publications and really try to train the community on how to do these best practices to be uh, adhering to open science principles. Um, why do we do this? So what is the value that we aim to get out of implementing open science and out of promoting open innovation? So first of all, is to advance science. We do have to go back to the first ideas, those big challenges that our society has to face. Has to face. Um, we need to, um, we, we want to get a more trusted and fair science and innovation process. This means more participation also from underrepresented communities, indigenous groups and so forth. 
um, making open access to or providing open access to all of these resources, not just data, but also the tools and uh, ensuring that those workflows are actually reproducible and reusable um, enables more participation and helps also companies and individuals compensate for the lacking resources and assets, thus reducing inequality. Finally, an open research process is one that is more trusted because it's open for scrutiny. Finally, if we reach the wider society, we have a good chance of this spilling over in non-space domains, and this is something that we're actively looking for, trying to attract more participation from domains that are not typically Earth observation, that are not typically space-based, uh, thus fostering commercialization. So where does this apply on the value chain? Um, these are working principles, and they're principles that work, but it's not a magic bullet. So when we talk about openness, Usually we think about downstream. So this is all the examples that I've, that I've given before with the use of the data. But there's a midstream, there's the data distribution, and there's an upstream. That is where we build the missions or the space, the space segment. All of these have their own challenges, and these principles are applicable in some areas, but not applicable in others. So this is something that we really need to think about. And we are actively thinking about this. In fact, ESA is now renewing its science strategy so in 2024, we will have a publication of the new ESA EO science strategy, which will include uh, a dedicated part on open science and open innovation. So we'll finally have it's an ESA approved language of how we speak and what we mean when we say open science uh, and when, when we say open innovation. So going back to these eight bullets, a lot of things need to happen. A lot of things need to fall into place for that vision to be happening. So there's the data which should be all of the project data, findable, catalogued with the DOI, openly accessible, uh, with the interoperable standards, uh, provided with the reusable uh, license. In other words, it needs to be fair and open. All the code uh, should be uh, properly managed, uh, version controlled, documented, uh, provided together with environment um, um, configuration so that everybody can rerun the same example, uh, rerun the same ex experiment, provided with examples, in other words, a fair and uh, open workflow. Publications, uh, there's classical journals, there's open access journals, there's preprints packaged with data and code. So there's uh, a lot of things to fall into place. And finally, there's the impact. So we need to have a community that is healthy, that is actively working on this, that knows how to do it, so has access to some guidelines, and that the practice is endorsed and communicated by space agencies. And finally, what is the value they get out of it? So we need metrics uh, to understand the value of openness. Just an example of how those pieces are trying to be put together. I'm just giving examples of activities. There's no, uh, let's say, public, special publicity for any of them, but just to give an example of how these foundational activities can be all put together in this big puzzle. So assuming that we have you know, all the data cataloged with the DOI accessible somewhere using um, uh, community uh, adopted standards, Stack is an example, uh, accessible through, through, um, through APIs, using open source technologies. In this case, it's a catalog that uses PyCSW. Um, assuming we're able to find this data, uh, discover it in such a system, and then that this data is accessible in a cloud native format, ideally, then we have the premises to use this data in a fair workflow in a platform that potentially is running on the cloud. I'll give an example of the Earth System Data Lab here um, that is a project uh, supported by the by ESA and I think you will learn about it in, in one of the coming presentations. Um, if the workflows are um, publicly accessible, again, discoverable with examples of how to work with the data, um, uh, supported you know, by uh, all the um, connected documentation and being able to be executed again and reproduced in a cloud platform, that's another good step. And here I'm just showing an example about the, using that, that same data set that you've seen before. However, there's not just one platform, there's not just one, uh, one solution, there are many such solutions. So we try to put together all of this into something that works in an integrated way. 
Uh, we are supporting development of interoperability um, across this kind of platforms through this initiative that we have together with NASA and the OGC. And keep an eye on this because in October we will launch a call for proposals for anyone that's interested to participate in this. Finally, I'm approaching the end. Education is key. We have an upcoming MOOC uh, in, the, um, in autumn uh, 2023, so in a couple of months, uh, that is trying to set the foundation for how to do open um, Earth observation uh, data science in the cloud. And I'm ending with the idea of community and part partnerships. Uh, ESA is promoting, uh, let's say, international collaboration through a number of initiatives. I'm just going to name two as the um, Earth System Science Initiative that we have together with the, our colleagues in DGRTD and the uh, science clusters, which are thematic clusters of activities uh, focusing on the diverse uh, thematics of the Earth System Science. And many, many collaborations. Um, there's um, OSGEO that we are uh, partnering with. Um, there's uh, ISPIS, there's, uh, there are colleagues in NASA, JAXA, AGU, RTD, um, Destination, Destination Earth Partners, uh, and a lot of publishers, including the SSD and the AGU and so forth. And finally, we're trying to put all this together for the Earth Science community. So for the ESA uh, Science Clusters and the Science Hub, not building another platform, but thinking we have all these foundational activities. Can we just build those bridges so that it's actually easy for our scientists to do the um, to do fair and open earth science in the cloud? This is what we're uh, hopefully uh, achieving. Hopefully, we will achieve with this uh, new activity that's called Earth Code. We're kicking it off in November 2023, and from January, it will be open for the whole community to contribute. Uh, either um, the community that is uh, more focused on development, on interoperability, on community building, on education, on open science. So everyone is invited to, to participate in this from January onwards. Thank you so much, and I hope I didn't go too much over time. Uh, we have time for questions. I just want to congratulate both uh, presenters of fantastic, inspiring talks. It's really to the point. And uh, yeah, if we could get the slides, maybe, is it possible? I think you have them. OK, <laughs> OK. Uh, questions? Uh, just to say, uh, Gilberto posted on Metromost uh, proof that uh, Brazil had the open uh, Earth observation data 2006. So you can read as a PDF. Um, Questions, please. Uh, this last thing, oh yes, Gilberto, please. Uh, first of all, of course, is to congratulate Isa and Anka for this uh, very important initiative. You got everything right and your talk resonates strongly with this community here. Uh, I, I don't know if you can provide some more details on the, uh, you mentioned that ESA is going to run a, an opportunity, call for opportunity, you mentioned briefly. So mm -hmm. if you want to just give more details to this community, which is very yeah. much interested on it. Absolutely. So there are these two opportunities. There is one uh, activity, the uh, Open Science Persistent Demonstrator that we do with OGC. So this is an, um, an activity that we fund together with NASA. So we put um, each of us about 500K per year. So that's about 1 million per year um, with the scope to demonstrate a reproducible workflows across platforms. So um, there's one element of uh, actually building interoperability uh, across different infrastructures. So ESA is contributing with, is make, provide, providing access basically to their infrastructure. NASA is doing the same with some of the systems that, they're, that they are managing. And we are inviting uh, also other space agencies. It doesn't matter which, uh, which geographical region you're from, um, but if you have uh, the, the need, let's say, to make your own system more interoperable with others, this is a good opportunity to participate. Uh, so there's one thing. This one will be, we, we had a um, uh, request for information that we just closed on the 17th of September, but the call for proposals will be launched now in October. And I think the first pilots will start from January and the first pilot will be focused on reproducible workflows. 
So this will be uh, the, the first theme. The second opportunity is this project that is called Earth Code. Um, and this one is really uh, focused on the earth science community. So it's not so much focused on applications, but it's rather thinking what are, what are the projects that we currently fund in ESA through other mechanisms, right? Uh, projects that are pro probably developing, you know, um, different geospatial products for scientific use that are not necessarily ESA products, right? So it's not an official ESA product, it's a community contributed product. So for those projects, we want to make sure that these products will be maintainable and accessible in the long term, because many times these projects end and that's where the, the, the product ends as well. So we want to make sure that we can rerun and have updates of these products and so forth. Um, so making sure that the, the community has the mechanism to do that data, provide the data in a fair and open way with the workflow in a fair and open way in the long term. Uh, so this is the scope of Earth Code. We focus on three things. One is, again, uh, making sure that those um, projects have access to the required infrastructure. So basically, how can they seamlessly access to the services of all of the platforms that exist out there? We don't want to build something new. We just want to use what exists, but it's not easy to do that now. Um, second is how do we provide them with the tools to manage the data and the code and documentation in a good way? And third is a focus on community. So building a community around this. And from January, you'll be able to, to participate because there will be open ITTs. Okay, more questions, Edzer? I have a, um, a question that I brought up a couple of times. Um, this is about open source software maintenance. Um, so there's, you know, you say open science and, and open data is one thing, open source software is another thing to use for that. Uh, there's a lot of projects out there that are being heavily understaffed and underpaid. And some of the work is, of course, innovative, is, is creating new features and so on. You could pay something to, you know, to write the GDAL Sentinel 3C driver or something like that is relatively trivial, but sort of the, the daily maintenance of large code bases uh, th these kind of things um, are there sort of currently the, the funding comes mostly from uh, embarrassingly from Amazon and Microsoft and so on. But would there be sort of is there thinking about how ESA could, could contribute to these things that essentially everyone uses? So you're talking uh, about the generic open source software, right? And the stack that everyone uses. Let's yes. say GDAL and GEOS yeah. and Python and R and, and Julia and so on, these kind of stacks. Right. Um, we do, we, we are thinking in this direction. Um, there is, uh, let's say, not something that we, we don't have a project, let's say, on the table that will, that will fund this immediately, but there are mechanisms that we do have available and, and that we try to promote uh, to steer, let's say, the, the, the topic about this, this particular topic in that direction. One of the mechanisms is network of resources. It may not apply exactly to the, what you are talking about, but it's a mechanism of, um, let's say, maintaining some of the open source software that produces some of those data sets that I was talking about. It's not the generic libraries, I know, uh, but it's one of the mechanisms that we're thinking, thinking to use. We are partnering with OSGO, uh, and hopefully through the dialogue that we will have with them and the stronger interaction with them, we will find new ways of, of uh, supporting also uh, this type of, uh, of software. So I'm hopeful, but I, I don't have a good answer for you now.